Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Guy Cunningham. I am Senior Vice President of Channel Sales at NetSurian, and this is the NetSurian podcast. And I am joined by Tom Guadagno of Velocity Network, um, located in the, the beautiful state of Pennsylvania. Tom, I appreciate you spending some time with me having a conversation today. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. So, Tom, you've been in cybersecurity and information technology for a significant portion of your career. The last 12 years, you've been in the MSP space. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you ended up there. You know, how did you end up being an MSP and, and working for and with Velocity? And what kind of led you up to that? It's uh, I actually started out in satellite communications for a company called Digital Music Express. If you're old enough to remember that, um, I was a studio. Uh, that artist. sounds like a cable channel music. That's uh, exactly what it was. Oh, wow. Good I, guess. I was a manager of studio operations and uh, actually built the worldwide origination center for them out in Denver. Uh, from there, I ended up in, in TV somehow uh, as a, uh, chief engineer for a two, two TV stations here in Erie, Pennsylvania. I did that for about uh, three or four years, then moved on to be the corporate director of IT. Spent several years doing that and uh, bought into a few TV stations. Once we sold those, I decided to go out on my own and uh, get into the MSP business. So I did that for 12 years. And after 12 years, I had a conversation with the good people here at Velocity, and we decided that uh, I'd like to come on board. It's a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity here and just a great organization. Well, I'll tell you, we've been impressed with our relationship with Velocity um, so far. And y'all are, you're in the uh, probably top 1%, 5% of MSPs. I mean, you're a substantial organization. Tell us a little bit about, you know, Velocity and, and how you serve your customers and what your lines of business are. I think at least in this region, Velocity is pretty unique in the services that we provide and the way we provide service. You know, we really look at it from the security um, landscape first. If we can't secure our company or you know, our clients, then there's no point because if you can't keep them secure, you're gonna spend all of your time cleaning up messes. So we really focus in on that. And we, we still support our customers. We still offer them great service, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really about that, that security level, that security layer. Yeah, I had a conversation with somebody just today and they're in the the network and the co-location and the cloud infrastructure space. And you know, they were telling me that cybersecurity is bleeding into every conversation that they have. Um, I, anything related to technology, I think, is always going to kind of circle back to the, the security aspect of it at some point. It is. And as I'm sure you've seen, you know, the threat landscape has changed just in the past couple of years. It doesn't even look the same as it did. You know, the types of threats we have, the threat actors are, it's big business. It mm. is, they, they are very well organized and managed and they run as a business. I heard a statistic not too long ago that the global cyber crime is a bigger industry than the global drug trade. And I would absolutely that believe that. Me. Yeah, I would believe that. We've seen a lot of money leave, even just our county here in the past six months, uh, millions and millions of dollars. Um, fortunately, I can tell you they were not our clients. Uh, some of them are That's now. Good. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you that. Uh, but it's just, um, you know, any way they can find to get in, they will They will get in. Uh, they're very patient. You know, gone are the days where you'd click on a file and, you know, get that ransomware that locks down your computer. Yeah, you, you still may do that. But really, when it comes to business, that's not what's happening anymore. They just they like to get on your network and they will sit there for a very long time to make sure they get everything locked down they could and steal your information. Yeah, I've seen the, the average dwell time of a cyber breach go from 270 days to now. I've, the latest I've seen is around 125, 130 days. It's still a long time. Yes. Um, so talk to me a little bit about some of the, the incidences that you've either been part of or that you've heard of in your area, uh, within your customers, um, you know, either how you've, you've, you know, you've, you've experienced a breach and gotten past it, uh, your customers necessarily, or how you've stopped it. Right. And that's, that's the, the better part of the story, hopefully. Yes. Yeah, so we've seen breaches from 
in many different vectors. Uh, most common is email. Uh, when someone does not employ two-factor authentication, especially, you know, Office 365, if you're not two-factor, it's not if you get compromised, it is when. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to get you sooner or later. And uh, that, that's been the majority of it. You know, we've had uh, people with or companies with absolutely no security. They've got their 15-year-old firewall and they said, well, we're secure. A lot of open ports, a lot of things that shouldn't be open are open. Next thing you know, they're shut down. You know, every every computer in the business has been encrypted. You know, and of course, now we've got that going on along with uh, data. They're taking your data and offering it up to the dark web if you don't pay. Mm -hmm. So the, the level of extortion is, uh, is becoming very popular. And, you know, a lot of the small businesses that that we hear about through our partners feel like they're not a target. And so they, they feel like they don't have to spend on the same types of solutions that maybe a large enterprise or a medium enterprise would. What, what's your philosophy on that? My philosophy is they are a target. They just don't know it. They're still living back, you know, 10 years ago, even uh, when you could take a chance on obscurity. Obscurity is gone. The odds are they already know you're out there. Uh, whether or not you've become of interest to them and what they're looking for to make you of, or to have you become interest to them. Um, that's a different story, but they are already a target. They don't care who you are. They don't care what you do. They just want your money. Yeah. And as a, as an MSP, I would think that even though the, the threat landscape and the threat actors targeting, you know, your customers have changed over the last couple of years, it's done some significant change targeting MSPs, you know, your business. We've heard a lot of statistics about threat actors targeting MSPs because you hold the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, for all of your customers. So how does that influence what you're doing to protect your own infrastructure? So we have added many layers of security. You know, first and foremost, I'll go back to two-factor. Everything we do here is two-factor. So we, we don't use any applications, any of our services, any login you have here, it's always two-factor authentication. Uh, if it doesn't meet up to that, then it's probably not something we need to be using here. You know, the second part of that would be, of course, monitoring. You've, you've got to watch what you're doing. You've got to have a good EDR platform in place. Um, you know, we use NetSurian across our networks. Actually, we're in the process, as you know, rolling it across all of our clients. Uh, and we're doing that in, in part on in our own expense because we believe it's so important to uh, to have that information and to have somebody watching your, your back door, you know, making sure that the doors are closed and no one's getting in. So it really takes a multifaceted, multi-layered approach, even email. You know, you can have spam filtering. You can have, uh, you know, something watching for compromises and for account takeovers. You know, we see a lot of that happening. If somebody doesn't have two-factor, we will see the account takeover. And we are moving all of our clients to two-factor. That is that I can't stress enough how important that is, especially in the email space today. Um, and we're going through the process now. And then at, at some point you have to decide if your clients won't let you keep them secure, are they really a good client for you? Do they make a good fit? You know, we've been having that particular conversation with our partners for several years now. Um, and we we started out offering our partners uh, a template for a liability release form, you know, some sort of document that they would get the customer to sign that says, you told me about all these things that you're recommending. I'm choosing not to. I'm not going to hold you liable if I get breached. Are you, you know, you said that you're deploying all of this across all of your customers. Do you still have some customers that push back? We do. We do, but you know we're changing internally how we handle those, uh, and we're to the point now where some of them we're just going to have to let go. Mm. You know, it's become too important, and you know we're risking our own reputation every time we try and support somebody who won't let you secure their network. Uh, and and I don't think it's worth us uh, taking that risk any longer. If, if they're not that, then I can tell you there's many MSPs out there that would be happy to to work with them. We're just not one of them. What kind of advice would you give to a, maybe a, a guy that's starting up an MSP and who may feel like he's got to take anybody and everybody so they can get revenue in the door? Um, you know, is what, what would your advice be? Is it worth it? Uh, how would how would you suggest that he think strategically about that? Yeah, I, I can tell you, I was that guy, so I, I know exactly what that's like. 
Um, and it was a mistake. You know, it, it did get to the point after three or four years where I had to look at my client base and give up quite a bit of revenue to let those clients go um, that weren't letting me do the right thing. And um, doing that, it, it reduced our workload. So the amount of time we were we were putting in went down. Our revenue went up because the clients we brought in were the clients who were targeted to be a good client for us. And that's probably the best advice. You know, figure out who you are and then make sure that the clients that you bring in are the clients that really fit who you are. You know, you'll be, They'll be happy and you'll make more money by doing so. Yeah, and I think that's something that anybody in any business could really learn from is, you know, know who you are know who your ideal customer is and really focus on that mm -hmm. um you know the the one-offs or the the outliers always cause problems and break process and, and make you make you more inefficient i think that's really good advice yep that's the truth so what's your approach are you you know the the typical msp has a good better best kind of package are you uh, offering you know bundles of services that grow in capability and cost? Uh, are you more of an a la carte shop? Um, are, do you have only one set of offerings? What's your what's your go to market look like? No, we, we pretty much offer as far as security is concerned. It's the same slate across the board. You know, here's what it's going to take. Here are the layers it takes to secure a network. Um, the options come in. You know, how big and how complex is your network? You know, and I'm, I'm going to go back to that Shurian as an example. Are we essentials or are we enterprise? Those are really the only questions that come in. But as far as the layers that we put in place, it's standard across the board. So you've got two-factor authentication. You've got a strong firewall in place. You've got endpoint protection, EDR. I believe you're using Sentinel-1 on, on the endpoints. Um, DLP, anything uh, that you would typically see in more enterprise type of customers or? No, there's um, the only other thing I, I would say that you didn't you know, mention on there is from the email. Uh, we do use Barracuda and we have the Sentinel component for all of our clients um, you know, just to watch for any account takeovers. So we spend um, a significant amount of time talking about the NIST cybersecurity framework you know, the kind of the best practices structure for how to secure an environment. Um, and I think that the the one piece of that that most customers and most MSPs that we talk to struggle with is the identify or the kind of the, the preventative or the predictive side of things is what is your thought around um, vulnerability scans, risk assessments. I mean, what are, what are you doing on the front end of that framework um, to kind of help mitigate the attack surface or minimize the attack surface before you start, you know, day-to-day -day care and feeding and operationalizing a customer's environment? Well, having control of your network is first and foremost, as I'm sure you're aware, it's very easy to lose control. Um, you let one person have permissions they shouldn't have um, and you've now lost control of your network. So having that locked down is first. You know, we're, we're a SOC 2 type 2 uh, facility. So, so we've been through the processes and a lot of that we have to do. So vulnerability scanning, we do. We do a monthly scan of our network. Actually, the scans are done daily. We pull the reports, you know, every month to make sure that nothing's changed. Uh, watching for changes in permissions, whether it's shares or on the network, uh, open ports, uh, external penetration testing. Uh, you know, we run, we have, of course, all the logging that Naturian does. We also employ Perch here, so we're actually watching the packets as well. Um, so there, there are many different angles that we are, that we uh, lock down from here and, and watch. And you have to. You have to, being an MSP, you have to be, uh, you know, on the top of your game. I think um, what you just described there is unique in the marketplace. There's not very many MSPs that are scanning their own network that frequently um so i applaud you for that that's that's got to be you know a decent cost but also you know a lot of effort involved in keeping up to date on that and analyzing that data you know what what choice do we have if we get compromised we risk every one of our clients yeah you know we're, we're just not willing to do that 
So we've talked a little bit about some of the, the vendor partners that you have in your in your network, in your in your customers' environments. Talk to me a little bit about how you view partners. What is what does a good partner look like for you? Uh, a good vendor partner is it is it just the technology or is it you know move beyond the the capabilities of the technology into the the company? What do you what do you look for when you're evaluating vendor partners? Well, technology is important, but beyond that, you need a good relationship. You need an ongoing relationship where you can work with people. If you've got issues, or you know, a lot of times we'll run into issues where it's just a lack of understanding. So, you know, having good training in place. You know, all of these things tie into to having a good partner relationship. You know, and I, I know so, I you know, reaching out to somebody, being able to reach out to somebody and say, hey, you know, we're having this issue. Is this us or you? Uh, and having a partner who's not going to say, hey, not us, and, and actually try and help you through that is is very meaningful. And as I as I think about partnerships, you know, I'm responsible for the program, the structure of our relationship with our with our MSP partners. Um, so there's there's the the kind of structural aspect of it, but then that relationship, you know, coaching my team and and the people that are interacting with our partners on a day to day basis is the soft skills are really important to making sure that you know we're we're approaching it from a customer centric perspective as opposed to you know the vendor centric perspective. Um, you know, sometimes whenever a, a partner program launches a, a new component or um, a, a new capability, not from a technology perspective, but from the program perspective, you know, the, the team that's building that thinks that it's the greatest thing ever. And then it gets rolled out to the partners and the partners are like, nah, you know, swing and a miss. Talk to me a little bit about maybe one of those situations where you've, you don't have to name any names, but you know, when, when has a vendor put something in place from a program perspective that wasn't well received by you know, either you or your peers. So you're talking about from the uh, partnership level? Yes, sir. Because I can tell you my biggest complaint um, right now is with another EDR solution. I mean, as, as you said, we're with Sentinel One, but our the previous company uh, made a good sales pitch. They had what looked to be a good product. Uh, and shortly after we took it on across all of our client base, they started to walk away from the product. Mm. So that, that's probably not a good thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and there was absolutely zero communication about uh, where the program was going, the support to dry it off. You know, it's it's, you know, and they're they're still in business and they're still trying to sell the product. Although, uh, you know, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody at this point. It didn't have mm -hmm. to be that way. Yeah. Well, so we talked a little bit about what you're doing today. Um, what are the some of the things that you're either looking into or researching or thinking about, you know, for the next year, two years, three years, you know, what, you, what's, uh, what's, what's consuming some of your future thought? Honestly, I would say AI, mm, okay. because I think AI is going to become more and more important to finding and detecting threats and ongoing, uh, ongoing threats in real time. You know, if, if you're notified of a threat or you're, the system you have in place tells you an hour or two after, after it's happened, a lot of damage could be done in an hour or two. Especially you know, nowadays, yeah. Right. So, so moving the bar closer to that, you know, real time uh, marker is really what the focus is. And that, that's what we're always going to strive for is just to keep moving that bar closer. So AI, there's there's a whole bunch of different um technical capabilities are kind of bundled under that big single moniker. Um, machine learning has been out for a while. Um, I'm assuming you're not talking about kind of the standard machine learning based solutions that require somebody to program an algorithm that can then look for the specific things that it was programmed to do. But you're talking about true self learning artificial intelligence, correct? Yes. Yeah. And I don't think we're far off from that in this in this space. I just saw a, an article about the first car that was designed by AI. So completely designed by AI, and then all the parts are 3D printed using lasers and metallic powder. And they're able to come up with these organic structures that a human engineer, A, couldn't design, and B, couldn't manufacture. 
mm. uh, using traditional um, kind of CNC and forging kind of processes. So it's it's definitely the stuff works, right? And it's working across a whole bunch of different industries. I think cybersecurity is is one of those areas where we're starting to see true AI finally become realistic and, and productive there. Um, any particular types of cybersecurity technologies that you're looking at that leverage AI? No, it, it's every single one of them. Everything's got to get smarter in, in that space. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, so what do you feel like is the biggest issue that the MSP space in general should be paying attention to, but we're not? You know, what's not being addressed today? <laughs> well, the first thing that comes to mind would be clients. <laughs> okay. You know, they are the biggest risk, getting your clients educated helping them understand. I mean, education, of course, has got to be a, a key component of anything we're doing uh, because people are the weakest link. Uh, and until we get them trained and smarter, we're going to continue to have um, problems that just, you know, compromises that just should not happen. So, you know, so expand on that a little bit, because I know that there's there's a lot of different vendors, not a lot. There's there's a handful of vendors out there that provide cybersecurity awareness training for companies. And um, most MSPs that we work with include that as a requirement or a, an included component of the solutions that they deliver. And when you couple that, you know, you're training everybody or should be training everybody with the fact that there's, there's going to be an endpoint protection solution on every device. And yet still we get 70% of breaches that originate at the endpoint. What what do you feel like needs to change there from a from an employee awareness, employee training perspective? I, I don't think you can change much except you know at, at the client level they can hold their people accountable. You know, one of the okay. things we do one of the things we do to help that is by we do testing, we do monthly testing at our clients. We will send phishing emails, uh, spear phishing emails, just to see who's going to do what. Um, let it be public. So and so failed. They're so careful. They so don't want to be on that list that they are extra careful. So you've seen that technique or tactic get implemented sure. yet? Or do you think, yep. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what do you, what was the impact? What was the outcome of that? It went from a 36% failure rate when we, when we started testing. After the initial training, we dropped down to about 15%. Uh, once the results were released, we started dropping down to about 10%. That's not insignificant. No, it's not. Interesting. Um, so is that something that you're rolling out across all of your customers? And, and I would assume that there's some sort of cultural component that uh, you know the company has to get familiar or comfortable mm -hmm. with doing that. Yeah, it really it's really done on a client by client basis. Some companies don't want their people no to know that they're being tested. So of course that, that, that is not gonna work there. Um, although I do try and talk them into it, if just you know, what's the end game here is to keep your network safe, not to trick your people and catch them. It, right. It's really to, to keep your network safe. You know, so we're always striving to uh, to do things that way. Interesting. So you're in uh, headquartered in Erie, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, would you say that most of your customers are centered in that Erie geographic area, or how far? Do you do you go? We have clients. Mostly, we are centered in Erie. We have clients in Cleveland. We have uh, clients in Buffalo. We have clients that have offices all around the country uh, and all around the world. We have clients with offices in China. You know, and, Interesting. You know, in Ireland, in, in Texas, in California. So we're, we're pretty much covering a, a fairly large geographic area. So, do you find any differences in your customers based on geography? Uh, approaches, no, philosophies, you know, anything? No, I, I don't think we could really, you know, every customer is so different. I don't think we could really break it down that way. Cool. Well, tell me, um, tell me if you feel like I haven't asked any questions relative to cybersecurity. You know, obviously you spend a lot of time thinking about cybersecurity um, as it relates to your customers and, and to your own network. What kinds of questions would you hope that somebody in my position would be thinking about, you know, either 
relative to this conversation or relative to the solutions that we're, you know, we're providing on a day-to-day -day basis? So I, I think really, how do we keep, you know, for, whether it's for you or anybody else, how do you know when you have as many endpoints as we do that you are fully deployed? You know, that, that's a big issue. You know, that, that's a big concern across the board. There are things we can do, but I, I think in, uh, I know in my own MSP when I had that, and even here, we're, we're always watching that and having tools across the board that could do that. So how do we keep, how do we keep every endpoint secure? How do you know that every end, endpoint is running all of the tools that are needed to keep it safe? Do you find that people are either intentionally or unintentionally disabling technologies, or are you more concerned about, you know, a device that got deployed in the network that just wasn't fully uh, configured properly? So a, a lot of what we do is deployed automatically. So when a machine comes into our system, of course, a lot of the software, including that Shurian, gets deployed automatically. But there are cases, uh, you know, there are instances where for some reason it doesn't happen. You know, when you're when you're managing tens of thousands of endpoints that, you know, it, it becomes, you know, hard to uh, to keep track of all those. Yeah. Yep. that's uh, that's interesting. So we have a capability. It's a report that's in our system about non reporting systems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, a device I, gets in, gets NetSharing installed on or event tracker installed on it, and then it stops reporting in. Right. Um, and across our partner base, that's a that's that's the number that doesn't seem to 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 go down very often, right? You know, we'll bring it up with partners, and um, you know, it's 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 confusing to me that most MSPs don't seem to be as concerned about those devices that aren't reporting in. Obviously, your situation is different. You are watching that. You're paying more attention to that. Um, what kind of advice would you give to me to, to share with MSPs about why it's important to pay attention to that? Well, even from the NetSurian perspective, let's talk about it just from there. The more information that I can give you, the better your, the better job your SOC can do in, in helping keep us safe. You know, it's very quick for me to go out and deploy to desktops and, and endpoints. You know, I can deploy that in 15 minutes. I don't care how many computers you have. Um, but now get your sonic wall or your you know, your firewalls tied in, get your Office 365 tied in. You've got to have everything tied in because if you're not watching all the vectors, they're going to find the vector that's not protected and that's where they're going to come in. Yeah, that's good advice. Well, as we wrap up here, I normally ask some personal questions on the front end of this conversation. So I've got two <laughs> questions for you. Um, Tell me about something that's unique to you, something that you enjoy to do <clears throat> that maybe the, the average person doesn't know about you. Hidden the talents average person, or, hmm. yeah. Well, I think uh, we, we had talked at one point, I am a musician. Now that's right. So you don't brag about that, it sounds like. Um, any, any particular instrument or are you a savant and you can pick up anything? I am primarily a keyboard player. I, I make that distinction from a pianist, <laughs> but uh, I can play anything but a reed instrument. If it's got a reed, I can't do it. But other than that, I'm I'm pretty much good to go. Wow, that's that's pretty impressive. I I play the guitar a little bit, and I have to really focus and struggle on that. So to be able to pick up something else and and be you know capable on it would be pretty pretty cool. So that's pretty cool. Um, and the, the last question, um, when you're talking to your family, you know, siblings, kids, significant others, parents, how would they describe what you do? <laughs> you know, when you talk to somebody and they have no idea what you're talking about, they get right. that glazed look and you get exactly. the courtesy nod. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they, they do their best. <laughs> Yeah, my uh, my kids always tell their friends, my dad's a computer dude, and I I I am a salesperson. I'm not a, a a technical person by any stretch of the imagination, but that's the easiest way for them to describe to their friends what what I do. Right, right, and that that'd be about right. Yeah. Well, Tom, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate it. We appreciate Velocity Network. And, and your partnership with us. Um, I'm impressed by your philosophy and how seriously you take cybersecurity for your customers. 
Um, you know, if I had to hold any organization up as a gold standard, I'd certainly pick Velocity Network. So thank you for spending some time with me, and I appreciate it very much. I appreciate that. It was good to be with you. Same here. Hopefully we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.